You are listening to ESG News and Views from the Conference Board. Hello, this is Paul Washington, Executive Director of the Environmental, Social and Governance Center here at the Conference Board. The ESG Center focuses on helping companies define and fulfill their evolving role in society by providing timely and relevant insights for what's ahead in the areas of corporate governance, sustainability, and citizenship. I'm truly delighted today to be joined by Millicent Ruffin, Director of Community Affairs in the Office of Racial Equality and Social Unity at Corning. Corning is one of my favorite companies. It's a leading innovator in material science with nearly a 170 track record of life-changing inventions and category-defining products. From Edison's light bulb to the Corningware products my parents used in the 60s and 70s, to fiber optic cables, to the screens used on smart devices and in medical implements, Corning is one of the rare companies that has been able to reinvent itself through innovation for well over a century. It's, it's a terrific business model for others to admire. And at the same time, Corning is an innovator in addressing social issues, most recently with the creation of its Office of Racial Equality and Social Unity. And I'm really delighted to be joined by Millicent today, who really leads the development and execution of Corning's programs that address racial inequality and socioeconomic disparities in communities around the world where Corning operates. Millicent recently participated in a program with us here at the ESG Center on how companies address social issues. And we were just so impressed by her and Corning's approach to this area that we wanted to dive deeper in a podcast. And Millicent herself is remarkably impressive. She came to Corning about 20 years ago as a senior scientist with her PhD in chemistry. And now she finds herself in a much different role. So Millicent, um, first of all, welcome. Glad you're here. Hi, Paul. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and second, tell us a little bit about your career arc at Corning. Um, it's it's a pretty remarkable journey. Thank you. I'm excited to be here and, and talk with you a little bit more about the great things we're doing at Corning. As you mentioned, I joined Corning 20 years ago um, as, a, as a bench scientist in their characterization group. And so... You know, when I when I joined, I was really focused on learning the ins and outs of, you know, how to be an innovator. How do, you know, we bring new products to market? And so the first, I guess, 18 years of my career have really been spent on learning the ins and outs of product and process development. Um, that has given me the opportunity to work with international customers and really understand, you know, what it takes to bring a new product to realization. Along the way, I've always maintained advocacy and, you know, kind of this pursuit of, of social justice as part of my leadership development. And, and that showed up in things like serving as president for uh, one of Corning's um, employee resource groups, the Society of Black Professionals. Um, and so in 2020, when these discussions started about Corning really taking the next step and really formalizing our activity in our community and and even in our nation, you know, it was the perfect place for me to to raise my hand and say, you know, absolutely, let me be a part of this um, because it allowed me to bring a longstanding passion of of working in the community and serving in the community and marry that with the work and the influence that Corning brings to it by committing to this more formally. I, I love that. I mean, it's it shows the benefit of of in some ways having those basic skills that you developed in terms of process and product innovation early on, and then being able to apply them in your current role, and at the same time, doing other work alongside your your main professional role that enabled you to take on what you're doing today. It's, it's kind of a nice model for how individuals and companies can reinvent themselves. You take those essential skills that you've developed, you couple it with a passion, and that can lead to innovation. So I, re- I really like that story. Yeah. So tell me a little bit, if you could, about 
Corning's history just generally in the area of addressing social issues and perhaps particularly specifically in how it's approached diversity, equity, and inclusion? Sure. So, you know, Corning's involvement and um, leadership on the side of diversity, you know, really started over 50 years ago um, when we created the, the, you know, the first employee resource groups. And that has been a longstanding commitment. And, you know, we started with one or two 50 years ago, and now we have almost 20 different employee resource groups within Corning that not only represent ethnic diversity and support for various ethnic diversity groups, but that also, you know, supports various gender identities. It supports, you know, families who, you know, may have children with disabilities or even employees with disabilities. And so we're really looking beyond just ethnic diversity in our in our internal efforts. And that, you know, that longstanding history is now what we're building from to create this community and um, nationwide effort. Great. And, and how was it? Maybe you can tell us a little bit. How was it that Corning, I mean, I know this predates your time there by 30 years, but how was it that Corning was really ahead of the curve in addressing and creating employee resource groups? I mean, that's really impressive. That's, that's 50 years ago. It, it is. I think that Corning's values start with valuing the individual. And mm-hmm. it's something that, you know, we as a company have remained committed to in our in our 170 year history. And so what that means is investing in the the dignity and the respect and the validation of all of our employees. And so starting from that core company value is is what led to the development of these ERGs, you know, even as a pioneer. And so, mm-hmm. you know, as early as the 1970s, um, Corning had started investing um, in HBCUs, for example. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. That's, that's great. It's interesting when there's this history of innovation. I, I like the tension between the two. Um, so let me ask you about the creation of office, the Office of Racial Equality and Social Unity at Corning, mm-hmm. an, another sort of innovation. And, and just to put in context, you know, a lot of companies uh, in the past year, but even before that, have been asked to step up and take stands on social issues. And, you know, to take a stand on an issue is one thing, following through is something else. And so companies, many companies are actually sort of struggling with First of all, figuring out which issues to take a stand on, um, what the process is, what the criteria are, and so forth. Um, And then how do you make sure that it goes beyond words and is translated into meaningful action and and impact? So how was it that, and tell us a little bit about the the office and, and how it was created. Yeah. So as you mentioned, several companies in the in the wake of the George Floyd murder took a pause and held listening sessions to really, you know, identify what can we do differently. And so our approach with the formation of the Office of Racial Equality and Social Unity was to to make sure we protect what we've been doing around diversity, equity and inclusion internal to the company. But then couple that with a community focused effort, and that is the the Office of Community Affairs that is focused on state and local efforts where Corning has locations. And then also extend that to have a national view to understand, you know, where are there policy issues that we should be, you know, aware of and tracking um, at the national level. And so the the co-location of all three work streams in one office is really important because it allows a partnership that, you know, would be difficult to achieve if we were, you know, just three siloed work streams. And so when an employee, for example, brings an issue to the chief diversity officer, you know, then that gives us the opportunity to partner so that we create an an event or a listening session so that we can address it both internal um, in the company for our employees, but also in our community, because we know if it affects one person, it's affecting many. 
And then, um, and then we also have the opportunity to partner with our government affairs office and, and really follow what's happening at the policy level. And so the three work streams, um, we, we actually work very closely together. Yeah, that's, that's, that's really terrific because we recently held a roundtable and we will be putting out a report soon on companies' financial commitments to, to racial equality that they made in the wake of George Floyd's murder. And one area of opportunity that we're seeing is for companies to do more on the governmental affairs side. Mm. Um, companies feel pretty comfortable, okay, we can tackle this internally. Um, they're doing some work to build relationships with their community organizations, and it's great. They're taking their time in some ways to do this because they know this is not going to be solved in a night, right? And it's you've yeah. got to take the time to build those relationships. But um, one area where they haven't necessarily done as much is on the policy side. And, you know, I think having the employees helps to make sure that it's genuine to your culture, communities, and the public policy side help to make sure that you're having broader impact with it as well. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it's really interesting. And and when was the office formed? And tell, tell us a little bit more, if you could, about where it reports and, you know, and, you know, how many, sure. how many people are involved, that kind of thing. People that should be interested to know how you actually staff one of these things. <laughs> <laughs> so the office formed in um, August of 2020, and we report into the chief administrative officer and chief legal counsel for the company, Louis Steverson, um, who, you know, in turn reports to uh, the CEO of the company. And so we are a relatively small organization um, right now. Our chief diversity officer has um, a, a, a manager reporting into her mm -hmm. that really supports the employee resource groups. Um, I think my office is a little more complex because we support where Corning has locations. And so mm -hmm. we have prioritized the New York and North Carolina regions because that's where the bulk of our employees of color reside right now within the U.S. And so we have two employees in New York and two employees in North Carolina. And as we, you know, really get our, our feet under us and really get some traction, we'll continue to expand to our other locations, such as Kentucky and in California um, and in Texas as well. And then um, with our, our national effort, our government affairs, you know, obviously we have um, employees in the D.C. area that we that we work with closely. OK, great. That's that's really helpful. So uh, it's, it's really interesting. This is a different model from a lot of companies where you've brought them all together in this office. That's got a fairly direct link to senior man, very, very senior management and to the CEO. So, again, that's a, a innovation that other companies may want to consider. So let, let me step back and ask you a little mm -hmm. bit beyond the, the organizational issues. You know, how do you all decide how to approach social issues? I mean, from racial equality issues to gender equality, you know, it, there, there's companies are facing uh, increasing demands, especially from their employees to take stands on these social issues. And it's, it can be hard because you, you, you know, there are so many topics that are out there and you know, if you just say we're going to ground it on our values, well, that that could enable you to take a stand on absolutely every issue that crosses <laughs> your desk, right? Um, because your values, you know, generally embrace most of these issues, right? right. Um, so how do you take into account, you know, maybe the alignment with your business or places where you do business or where you think you can really have an impact? What, what are the other factors you consider in deciding whether and how to take a stand and make a commitment to addressing a social issue. Yeah, you you touch on a on a great point um, because there's no shortage of of things to do, and everyone has their their personal passion. And so, you know, we've we've started with our focus area around our our communities where Corning has locations. And so, the first thing that we look at is you know. 
how high is the need in our community? Is it urgent? Is it, you know, is it an emergency situation? And then we do go back to our values and we say, how closely tied is this issue to our mission and to our values, not just the Office of Racial Equality and Social Unity, but also to the mission and values of our company as well. We want to ensure alignment. Um, but we also look at, you know, do we have the credibility and the influence needed to make a difference? Will our voice matter in this space? And so we factor all of those, you know, all of the, the answers to those questions into our decision. But then we also look at how we act. Is this a place where, you know, we need to be the leaders and we need to be out front? Or is this a place where, you know, we just help amplify a message that's already out there and expand the reach? And sometimes the answer may be that this is a, a place where we remain latent and, and potentially just provide in-kind support, you know, whether that is, is people, hours, it's, it's rarely something where we choose to just throw money at a problem. That's really not what we're, what we're about, but we, we really factor in, you know, not just do we take a stand on this issue, but also how do we do it? Right. And, and a couple of really important points to my mind there. One is Make sure you've got the credibility and ability to have an impact because companies, the blowback that they might face from taking a stand on a social issue is often not just from people who might disagree with the position you're taking, but it's for those who say, well, wait, that's not authentic or you're not going far enough and so forth. The other thing, of course, is, you know, the how is important because you don't have to take a position or take action on every social issue in the same way. So... Don't feel like, okay, we've got to put a press release out on everything. We've got to set up a separate program on everything. No, you can sometimes join other people's efforts, mm -hmm. um, you know, there and and be play a supportive or amplifying role. You don't have to be in the lead. And I think that allows companies more flexibility to be involved in more social issues because they don't have to do it all at, you know, nine or 10 on a scale of one to 10. They can position themselves as a three or four on some of these issues. That's right, Paul. I, I really appreciate your comments there because I think one of the things that, that I enjoy and really love about this effort are the times where we get to be hands-on and be feet on the ground um, to, to make you know, an effort successful. And, and those are the most rewarding um, you know, as opposed to, to writing a check to support something. Right. I definitely understand that. So let me ask you about some of the main challenges and opportunities you see, whether it's for Corning or for companies in general, in addressing the topics of racial equality and social unity. I mean, those, those are big topics. They're going to take a long time to get there. We're, we're, we're starting from a place that's kind of far away from equality and unity, you know, and so where do you think companies should be putting their their efforts and what are the best opportunities? Where can they have the biggest impact? And what are some of the challenges you think they'll need to address along the way? I, I think balancing expectations is, mm -hmm. is the biggest challenge that, that we come across from the perspective are of, you know, are we moving at a pace that you know, satisfies people. Are we are we moving mm -hmm. fast enough? Um, not just to satisfy people, but to to have an impact before the opportunity, you know, the window of opportunity closes. Um, but but at the same time, when we choose to act, making sure that we're thinking through any any unintended consequences, right? Um, mm -hmm. Because. Our decisions are not are not made in a silo. And so, you know, we really have to balance the time we have to act with making sure we understand all of the implications of the decision as well. Great. That's really helpful. So a, a sort of final question and kind of in two parts. Let's say you've got a room full of 100 CEOs who know they ought to be doing something about racial inequality and aren't quite sure what. Um, what's your advice for them? Now you've got a room of 10,000 employees across those companies. 
What's your main advice for employees of what other their racial or ethnic background for how they can um, help ensure that their company is making a difference? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, you know, I'll, I'll say the way we started was first from relying on our, our company values. And so that that whole sense of valuing the individual and valuing the communities where we live and where we work um, really set the foundation for for how we would move forward. And then the next thing we did was listen, listen mm-hmm. to the experiences of our employees, but also the experiences of our community members that that don't work for Corning, um, because that is oftentimes where the greatest need um, you know, where the greatest need lies. Um, and so, you know, I, I think that having, you know, being given the time to be intentional in understanding the needs of the community, just being given that that grace period of time to learn the needs of the community and then decide on how to act um, has really been what's helped us form partnerships and collaborations within the communities. And I feel like the organizations and the individuals that we're working with, they know and they believe that we're in it for the long haul and that we will succeed together. And when we miss the mark, we will try again together. Great. So I think that's terrific. So be aware of your values. And certainly as a leader, listen that's awfully crit- listen before you lead or yes. in order to lead you can basically lead by listening that's that's yep. a, a, a great a great lesson um, and uh, recognize that this is a long haul effort and being transparent along the way mm-hmm. so those are great great piece of advice for anyone at whatever level of a company that's trying to bring about change so Millicent, I just want to thank you I want to let everyone know um, that the conference board, which is the world's leading nonprofit, independent, nonpartisan think tank serving business and society, has a website, conference-board.org, uh, where you can find a lot of resources on this topic. Um, so, for example, we have a report on how companies can make decisions and a difference on social issues, which Millicent helped us with, uh, contributed to the conversation on. But any mistakes in it are ours. They're not hers. Um, <laughs> Uh, we also have a report on how companies can make an enduring difference in cities. And that report makes a very, it echoes your point, Millicent, which is the importance of listening, that companies shouldn't just show up with a big checkbook. They need to show up with their ears open and really make sure you're hearing from the nonprofit organizations you're going to partner with about what the community needs and, frankly, what the nonprofit can realistically do, right? Because yeah. sometimes they put their own best foot forward and, and that you really have to understand their, their you know, legitimate circumstances. And then we're coming out with a report in the coming weeks on corporate investments and in racial equality a year later, where we'll be uh, talking about where companies stand in fulfilling their commitments, uh, financial commitments relating to racial equality. I think it'll have some surprising results. So I think you'll be interested in reading in that, reading that. So Millicent, um, I just wanna thank you again for your, your thoughtful conversation today and for really your innovative leadership in this whole area. It's, it's, it's always a delight to spend time with you. Thank you, Paul, likewise. Thanks for the opportunity. Great. So for everyone, thanks for joining us today. And you can always find additional podcasts, those reports, webcasts on all things relating to corporate governance, sustainability, and corporate citizenship by visiting the ESG uh, News and Views at conference-board.org. Thanks again, Millicent. Thanks you all for listening. This has been ESG News and Views from the Conference Board.